Today, we're looking at navigating the Allen & Heath SQ Series input channels and how they work with processing. So you'll wanna stay tuned for this one. Let's jump in. If we haven't met yet, my name is James. And if you're wanting to do a great job at running sound at church and have fun doing it, you found the right channel for you. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and welcome to the Club of Sound Ninjas. So today we're talking about the input channel processing and I couldn't do anything about the saws and jackhammers outside. So if you hear those in the background, my apologies. So when we're navigating our console, we can select channels and we showed in the last video how we get those inputs named, we get them put on layers so that we can control them, have them where we want them. Now let's talk about what to control within them as well. If we select a channel, there are two different ways that we can see our selected channels. One is an overview of many of the selected channels. You can see each channel strip. We've got kick, snare, toms, bass, etc. We can scroll over with the touch screen to get to other things that are on the current layer. Or if we select a certain channel, it will show this channel and then the parameter that we've selected. Starting up at the top, it's important to understand that with the SQ series, the signal flows from the top down. So you can visualize what's happening with each processor and where it falls in the signal chain. So up at the very top, we have our preamp. And in the last video, we also mentioned setting up phantom power for channels that need it. You press and hold the 48 volt button until it lights up red and now you've got phantom power on. They make you hold it so that you don't accidentally turn it on or turn it off as can be easily done with a touch screen. Now, a couple other things to look at when we're on this screen. We did patching last time on the IO screen, but you can also select your source select. Here you can see we've got it on the S-Link, which is the digital snake down on the floor beside me, and it's socket number one. If we go and then select all the other channels, you can see those are going up in ascending order because we organized our console well. That's a great thing to do. Keep organized, you're gonna stay sane. So that's coming in channel one. So if you need to troubleshoot something or if you're not sure where it's supposed to be plugged in, that's where you can look. If you need to change that, that will say you can have it go from a local socket, USB port, all different kinds of things. Or you can set it up to be the signal generator, but I don't recommend that unless you really know what you're doing. So X out of that, we're gonna keep that there for now. There is a pad on the preamp. So if you've got a very hot signal coming in and you are trying to turn down your preamp very low, hitting the pad will give you more control over the gain. We can touch a function and whenever this lights up yellow and that's yellow, that means that they're paired and you can adjust that parameter with this knob, right? So that's another little handy thing you can get around and make any parameter here. You can also see that up here, we have our preamp or gain control knob that's dedicated. So we don't necessarily have to get to this screen. We could be on our EQ or compression and make adjustments to the preamp if we wanted to. Now, just a friendly reminder from your neighborhood audio nerd, the preamp affects everything downstream. So use this with caution if people are already listening to the signal, say if they're using their in-ear monitors, your preamp would affect their level and how they hear themselves. If you turn them up at the preamp, they might be very unhappy with you. And I would like you to avoid that problem at all costs. So we can take the pad off if we need a little bit more signal, but now you know that that's there. The input delay, I would not mess with until you're a super nerd and you're trying to time align different things. It can be very handy, but it can get you in trouble if you don't know what you're doing with that. So word of advice, if you don't know what you're doing, leave it alone. Now, another thing to do that you wanna check on here is the polarity and the trim. There's two different ways that we can turn it up and down, right? We've got trim, which turns it up and down, and we've got gain that turns it up and down. You can see that the trim starts at zero and can go below zero. So we could actually turn something down more, whereas the gain only turns things up. Now these are two totally different controls, but they're doing the same thing in different places. And let me explain why. The gain is turning up the analog signal before it gets captured by the analog to digital converter. This is the device that takes thousands of little pictures of the audio level over time to turn it into ones and zeros. So it goes from wiggling electrons to ones and zeros. If we use the gain, that's happening before it hits that converter. And the healthier signal that we have hitting that converter, the clearer signal that we'll have to some extent. You don't have to get all fussy about it. I mean, it's not gonna ruin somebody's day, but you wanna use the best gain possible. And you're trying to add, aim for this point where it says zero. So if you see your signal level hitting zero or the place where 
green turns into yellow, you're in good shape. The trim is a digital level adjustment that happens after it's come into the console and hit the analog to digital converter. So imagine that you need your level down a little bit more, but you don't want to adjust the preamp. You could use the trim. The preamp would also affect anything else that's sharing that gain stage. So if you have a second board for running monitors or broadcast, the preamp would affect that where the trim would only affect this board, but it's still gonna affect everything downstream on this board. The next thing to look at is the polarity switch. This is the absolute push-pull of an audio signal, and it matters most when we have two different microphones on the same sound source. So in churches, this mostly means that it's drums. So when you have an overhead mic and a snare close mic, if the timing of the low end of that snare drum is opposite at the close mic and the overhead, those will tend to cancel out and make the snare drum sound thinner. If you flip the polarity on one or both of those, that can make it so that everything is pushing and pulling at the same time and your sounds will be thicker. Another place to do that is with a snare top and snare bottom microphone because they're pointing in opposite directions at the same sound source. One add-on that you can get for your board is the tube preamp stage. And so it emulates what a tube preamp would sound like to give it a little bit more analog character. I made a video about this and wrote an article for Church Sound Magazine. I'll link to both of those down in the description below if you wanna check them out. So to pull that up, we can hit the library button. This library Library button's pretty important, so you're gonna wanna remember where this is. And we can see, if we go to factory, we can see there's a tube stage model for the preamp. If you don't want anything, you hit no model and recall that. But if you hit tube stage and hit recall, now we can turn on the tube stage and choose a bunch of different methods of tube stagiosity. You can experiment with them to see how much character they add, but they add a dynamic character to the signal. So it might not have any distortion or saturation at a low level, where it might have some of that as the input signal gets stronger and comes in a little bit hotter. You can play around with this, with the level, with the fine adjustment of compression or bias or the different things in there. And I'm not an analog super nerd, so I can't tell you exactly what all those do. You just gotta play with it and try stuff. Again, if you wanna clear this, we can turn it off to bypass it. Or if you want it to be disappearing all together, you can go back to the library, hit no model and recall, and it's gone. You don't have to worry about it at all. Moving down the line, the next thing in our path is the high pass filter. This gets rid of the unwanted rumble and low frequencies that can clutter up your mix and make things less intelligible. You can make changes to this either by touching and dragging on the screen. You can see the number is changing there, or you can change the frequency with the knob. If you're a knob turner and prefer that to touch screens, you very well can do that. And my recommendation for this is Turn it up a little bit, then turn it up till it gets thin, and then back it off till it gets naturally thick again. That's probably gonna be a good spot. There are different slopes. You can experiment with this, or you can leave it alone. It's not gonna make a huge difference if you're just starting out. Don't stress about it. There are differences, but we don't have to go into them today. It also has an in and out button to make sure you wanna do that. It also has its own dedicated knob so that if you wanna make adjustments to the high pass filter on the fly, you can do that and bypass it as well. So you can see we had the preamp up here and then the high pass filter. Next comes the gate and we can see that on the screen as well. The gate operates just like any other gate. We have our threshold, which says when we want the gate to open and we have the depth of how much we want to turn the signal down before it goes above the threshold. So for a lot of drums, uh, usually 10 dB is enough for me. We'll demonstrate this a different time when we go through that. But the attack and release time and the hold time also help you shape how that gate opens and closes. More on that later. But the best part of this is that it shows you over time how much you've been turning it down with the gate. So when it's in the red, you can see that it's been turned down. As I change the depth, you can see that bar is moving over time so that I can see what's happened. Did I miss some drum hits, right? Were there some things that were happening that I didn't know should have been there? And it gives you some time to adjust and see what's been going on there. You can also see as a drum hits, how quickly it's coming back up. If it's coming back up all the way before the next drum hit, very, very handy tool. You can also filter the key for your gate with this filter in, and you can choose which type of filter, high pass filter, band pass filter, or low pass filter, and select the frequency there as well. Or you can even choose a different channel that could key the input as well. That's beyond what we're going into today though, but 
we'll come back another time. Next up, we have our EQ section. And the EQ section has additional controls over here. See, we had the high pass filter and the gate over here. Now EQ is next and it has its own three sets of knobs. It doesn't just get one, it gets three because it's that cool, right? So we can bypass it or put it in. And for each band, we've got our low mids, high mids and highs. We can select with these buttons and then these three knobs become our EQ controls, frequency, gain and width. So if we wanted to take our low mid band and come over here and cut a little bit, then we decided that was too wide. We can take this and make it a little bit narrower and a little bit wider. Again, any of these parameters you can select here on the screen and use the yellow knob if you prefer. You can also turn on the RTA or the real time analyzer that shows you the relative level of the different frequencies of that input in real time. So if something is starting to ring and you're hearing feedback, you're gonna see that line go up and you can know that's where I need to put a notch frequency to make this feedback less prone. Some other things to note over here is on the touch screen only, we can change our high band to be a low pass filter. This is super helpful because unwanted high frequencies can clutter up your mix. Not quite as much as unwanted low frequencies, but they still do. So I really like low pass filters. You can get that there, or you can switch it to a high shelf. So if we go to our high frequency, now you can see that everything above that point gets the same amount of gain all the way up to 20 kilohertz. So high shelf, low shelf, all of that is available for these buttons over here. Next up, we've got our compressor. And the compressor comes after the EQ because most of the time in a live situation, you're gonna wanna cut more than you boost. So you don't want the stuff that you're cutting out to be triggering the compressor. So they have it fixed so that the compressor comes after the EQ. There's two things that I want you to notice here. The first is that this is another gain stage or another place where we're turning it up and turning it down overall, not just specific frequencies. And that's this output gain. If I turn this output gain back down, you can see that the yellow line and the gray line are together. As I turn it up, you can see there's a difference between the gray line and the yellow line. This is showing us how much we're boosting the signal after it's been compressed. We can choose our ratio here. I usually like around four to one. And we can select our threshold. This is also our threshold control over here. So we can move this up and down to choose at which point in the dynamic range we want to start compressing. Another setting that I really like having, especially for vocals and bass, is a soft knee. This makes the transition from one to one down below the threshold to our full ratio a little bit gentler. So it's best on things like vocals, acoustic guitars, and bass. I like a hard knee on inputs like drums. I think it acts a little bit faster. It's a little bit more aggressive. If this is a little bit nerdy for you, don't worry, I'm not gonna leave you in the dust. We'll go over that in other videos. One other thing to note is that peak and RMS mode are gonna operate differently. RMS is a way of saying average for something that's oscillating back and forth, and peak means the absolute levels. So sometimes you want to take the overall like big picture changes of how a signal is behaving and compress that. And other times you want to catch every peak and every little nuance that's sticking out and compress that. There are different ways to do it and you can experiment with that, but I'm just giving you the bird's eye view of how the input compressor works. Now, if you go to the library, you can find there are different models that maybe you've paid for the add-on to get. So we've got manual peak and manual RMS. We've got ducker mode, opto mode. Let me see if we've got opto mode here. And no, this console does not have that add-on purchased. They do over in their other building, but not on this board. So I can't show you that today, maybe another time. One thing that could be cool or could trip you up is this parallel path button down at the bottom. If we turn this on, we can mix in the dry signal or the uncompressed signal with the compressed signal. So if we wanted to really crush something, but then not lose all of its dynamic range, let's say we're compressing something very hard to get its aggression kind of feeling or a very pumping feeling, but we don't want that to be the only thing that we feel from that input. Man, I am getting way down in the weeds. I apologize, but you just gotta bear with me because hey, you're watching this video. So we could turn down the wet signal all the way after we've compressed it and made it really chunky and thick or something like that and turn up the dry signal and then turn up the wet signal until we get that feeling that we got from the compressor without losing the natural dynamics. And you can balance those back and forth to hear what's going on 
with the one that's compressed and the one that's not compressed. Also on the compressor, you can see your history of how much gain reduction you've had. Let me demonstrate with my microphone that I have here. So we can see that I've got some level coming in on this channel. So let me switch over to this microphone so that you can hear what's going on with this and we can demonstrate some of the stuff that's going on on the compressor, although this is not a vocal compression tutorial. That'll come later. So here we've got the channel selected and we can see that our threshold is down. We can adjust our threshold over here. You can see that's a lot of gain reduction and that probably sounds really squishy even though I can't hear it right now. And we can turn it up and get a little less gain reduction. But we can see with the history meter or the histogram or whatever they call it that I had some compression. Now you can see that for the last 10 seconds or so I've had hardly any compression or I'm not engaging the compressor at all because the signal level is too low to reach the threshold. So if I turn this down, I can start to see more of that. And this first line here is negative 10. That's about as far as you want to go on most vocals. So if it's going below negative 10 a lot, that might mean that you need to raise your threshold some. One other thing to remember is that after you get some gain reduction, you go to the gain and turn that back up and you'll see that yellow line and the gray line separate telling you that you're turning it up some after you've turned it down with the gain reduction. So you made it through the input channel processing. Hopefully you've got a better grid for how your console is laid out and how all the things fit together, what all these different controls are doing. If you're running sound at church and you're not exactly sure how it should sound and you haven't clarified exactly what winning sounds like for your church, I've got a free guide for you called How to Lead Your Church Sound Team. You'll want to download it through the link in the description below. We talk about how loud it should be, how bassy it should be, what the different parts of running sound are, and who you should look for to add as your next team member. If you want to do a great job running sound and have a lot of fun doing it, this is the place for you. Go ahead and mash that subscribe button. Hit like if you like this video and be sure to check out other videos in this playlist in the link in the description below as well. As always, remember, it's all about the low end. Avoid the sound tech solo and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.